Uh, he's the executive director of the Rethink Music program um, at Berklee College of Music, and uh, I think a lot of the research he's done is very, uh, I don't know, particularly pertinent, and it's really great that he can be presenting a lot of his stuff here and now. So I'd like to welcome Alan Bargfried. Thank you, Nick. Hi, guys. Happy to be in Australia. It's my second time here, um, and I hope the next time I come, I will be able to stay longer than the four days I'm staying this time and the five days I stayed the last time. Um, Nick invited me to come out and talk a little bit about our Rethink Music Fair Music project. So uh, for the past year, we've been looking at the issues surrounding transparency and payments in the music industry. Um, we've, we've wrapped that up with a phase one report that came out in July um, that's available now for free download on our website at rethink-music.com. And we're going to be moving into our phase two of that project uh, coming up starting on October 2nd with an event in Boston. And I'll tell you a little bit more about both. So we undertook over the last year a, um, a research study to look at kind of what's happening between artists and streaming services. So there's been a lot of um, media attention paid to small streaming payments. You've had uh, Taylor Swift come out against Spotify, removing her music from Spotify for not having uh, or for not being able to only put it on the premium tier. You've had artists like Aloe Black come out and say that they were paid a paltry $2,000 for millions of streams on Pandora. And so we, what we wanted to do was try to find out what was happening. So are the payments from streaming services really that small? Is there, are there too many people in the middle taking a cut? What really is happening? So um, over the last year, we conducted a one-year study um, looking at payments and data standards. We uh, reviewed various recording and publishing royalty statements and agreements. We talked to over 65 people within the music industry, and we came up with a couple of key questions. One of them being, are the compensation structures within the music industry now fair? And the second is, how might technology solve some of these problems that are coming about? Um, so today we have um, worldwide a $15 billion um, global music market, um, as reported by IFPI in 2014. And there's been a tremendous shift, particularly in the past two years, from this pay, as, pay up front model of purchasing music to the pay as you go access model of streaming music. Um, there were 164 billion on-demand streams in 2014, up 60% from 2013. I think a lot of countries are now reporting that streaming, streaming revenue um, surpasses digital download revenue. Universal Music last Friday reported that earnings in 20, uh, I think in the Q2 of 2015, um, were up 19% and attributed most of that to streaming. And mainstream media, again, as we just noted, um, often covers these stories about small payments to musicians, and we were really trying to undercover, uncover what is happening in the middle. So oftentimes those major media outlets are reporting that there's a small payment, but they don't tell you where the payment came from. They don't tell you how many songwriters there were. They don't tell you if it came from a PRO, if it came from a record label. Uh, but most of the time, or really all of the time, those payments did not come directly from the digital services. So we set out to kind of find out what's happening in the middle and how maybe we can solve some of those issues. Um, so revenue splits. Uh, AFP research, um, talking again about the growth in streaming services, found that by 2018, there will, they will have paid $46 billion in cumulative revenue so far, um, with 191 million uh, worldwide paying subscribers. Um, streaming services also generally pay about 70% of their revenue and keep 30% for their costs. It's the same percentage that iTunes is taking. Musical works owners generally receive about 10% of that 100% pie, with the rest going to record labels um, who are then splitting it with artists. And um, a study last year from SNEP, the trade group in France, found that record labels keep about 73% of all royalties that are paid out to rights owners by streaming services. Um, there is also a conflict of interest between the duty 
uh, to shareholders in a music company and a duty to the artist. And again, what we were trying to look at is really how do you drive more transparency so the artist understands or the songwriter understands what's happening to their royalties. Um, at Berkeley, we're, we have no interest other than the musician or the creators and the, and the 1,000 graduates that we have coming out from our college every year. So what we were trying to do is figure out how to have a um, healthy music ecosystem. Um, in the middle, and a lot of this stuff has been already reported, there have been equity stakes, non-disclosure agreements, and other payments happening between particularly record labels and publishers and the streaming services. Um, so many labels and some publishers have equity stakes in streaming services. Those equity stakes sometimes pay off. Um, Universal Vivendi, or Vivendi, the parent of Universal, made $404 million when Beats was bought by Apple last year, none of which was shared with artists. Um, and so it could be beneficial to have a supplier owning part of uh, a distributor. Um, but in this case, they're not actually sharing the money with artists, um, and we believe that that's wrong. Um, digital services often, off, often also have a non-disclosure agreement, so that prevents artists from being able to audit the payments that are coming from streaming services to record labels and publishers. So if you're an artist, you have no right to understand exactly how Sony or Warner or other major services or other major labels or publishers are being paid by the streaming services. Um, it's not unusual for um, companies in business to have a confidentiality clause in their business agreement. Uh, we just advocate that artists are able to actually audit that amount that's being paid and make sure that they're being paid correctly. Um, the Sony Spotify contract, which I think um, probably a lot of you saw, came out, came out earlier this year. Um, in May, was it was leaked from 2011. Um, showed a number of advances being paid from um, streaming services to labels. And there became a lot of questions about what happens if that advance is not earned out. So, if Sony was paid a $15 million advance and they only earned out $12 million, where did the $3 million that Sony got for that year go? And there was a lot of dispute about this. Sony came out and said, well, we're going to pay what is what they call breakage, as opposed to the old industry term of breakage for vinyl records. They were going to pay that to artists, but they didn't confirm that they had been paying that in the past. Uh, Warner had come out and said, and shown that they had been paying it since 2009, and I think Universal made a statement that they were also going to start paying that amount out. Um, and then there's some other concerns about um, service payments. So some streaming, some record labels and rights owners are charging uh, service payments for rights to a catalog. And again, there's a lot of question about where this money is going and why it's not being paid to artists and writers. So in general, you have fairly low streaming royalty rates, but you have a number of other payments or equity portions that are going to rights holders or people in the middle, and it's not always necessarily making it to the artist. So in our case, we just try to advocate for more transparency from the label and the publisher to the artist and writer so that they better understand where the money is going, um, particularly since we're headed into a period where streaming will be the dominant uh, consumption method for music. Um, the black box. How many of you have heard of the black box? Few people, which one? <laughs> um, so oftentimes, um, streaming, service, streaming services and other digital music services don't know who to pay. So there's a concern um, that there's a lack of a copyright registry. People don't, or streaming services and digital services don't always know exactly where to license music. And that means that oftentimes they have music on their services that's not properly licensed or that they don't know who the correct owner is and that they can't allocate those payments to someone. And what ends up happening is they place that money into an escrow account, and generally that escrow account gets paid out at a later date to people who have the highest market share or based on percentage market share. So again, that tends to benefit major labels and major publishers to the detriment of smaller artists who don't have um, rights ownership information with the services. Um, we looked a little bit at PROs, at least on the, um, writer side because it was really more of a US focused study. PROs generally have had a, a problem with transparency in the past as well. They've used sampling to pay out royalties to writers and artists. Um, they're not truly monitoring every radio station or every live music venue because in the past it's been impossible. Um, this morning, um, I think it's Dan Rosen was talking about 
um, a new service here in Australia that's, catch, that's capturing um, play in live music venues based on a Shazam type fingerprinting service. So I thought that was really excellent to hear that that, that technology is being implemented. Um, there continues to be significant delays on international payments and all of this is leading to anomalies in payments uh, back out to artists and writers. As part of the project, we also did a royalty audit. So as I said, we looked at a number of um, publishing and record label royalty statements. One in particular that we looked at came from a Q4 statement from Universal Music to a Grammy-nominated multi-platinum artist. Um, and so I think the first astounding thing that we found was that this royalty statement was almost 120 pages long in PDF and had li I believe it had 2,800 lines of, of royalty reporting. So on these different pages you were seeing 50 cents, $10, $20, and it's really impossible for a smaller artist to be able to audit something like that. So in a world where you have the ability to have real-time royalty reporting on digital services, some companies are still issuing uh, paper royalty statements or PDF royalty statements. And in this case, this particular artist was big enough and had the financial resources that they could hire um, an auditing firm to look at these statements. But if you're a smaller artist, you don't really have the ability to do that. Um, we also found instances of negative streaming. So they were actually recapturing streaming payments and could not tell us why that was happening. Um, we found no evidence of the the payment of advance breakage or breakage advance payments. Um, and then a little bit about the royalty rates, we found that YouTube was paying the lowest royalty rate of any of the digital services at 0 .001 or a tenth of a penny per stream. And the Tidal Hi-Fi service, which charges double most of the streaming service subscription fees, uh, was paying uh, a penny and a half per stream. Um, again, the royalty reporting should be online and it should be real time, that capability exists. And for artists and writers, there's also a, an ability, or there could be an ability for them to use that information to determine where to tour. So if you know in real time where you're getting a lot of streams, then you can start to look at marketing yourself in those regions, you can start to look at setting up a tour in those regions, um, and just driving that data and providing that data on a faster basis to your artists and writers would really enable them to build careers. Um, another part of what we looked at was the technology standards and the technology that exists. So a lot of the problems exist because um, there's not a, a real true um, across the board level of data reporting standards. So you have digital services that are reporting based on or they're each reporting in different formats to different rights owners. So there is no standardization. Sony wants a different type of reporting from Universal, wants a different type of reporting from a smaller independent label, wants a different type of reporting from an aggregator. <coughs> There's also no link between an ISRC and an ISWC. So for those of you who don't know, an ISRC is the international standard um, identifier for a sound recording the ISWC is an international standard identifier for musical composition, you would think that those would be linked or that there would be a process for saying, okay, this ISRC or this sound recording contains this ISWC or this musical composition. That also does not currently happen in the world of streaming reporting. Um, there's no requirement to use any of these standards and the lack of the rights database continues to um, cause pay more payment anomalies. So really we were finding that there's a significant problem on the technology back end of the, of the music industry. So over the past 15 years, the music industry has really moved forward on the digital consumption side and on the technology side, but hasn't really updated on the back end. Um, earlier this year, the US Copyright Office came out with some recommendations. Um, greater parity in the treatment of musical works and sound recordings, I think this is um, somewhat of a global issue. So more payment for musical works in comparison to song recording, sound recordings. Um, some of this is very US centric and maybe doesn't apply to those of you from Australia, but uh, full, copy, full federal copyright protections pre-1972 recordings, which does not exist in the US right now. A full performance right on commercial radio, so I think the United States is one of only three countries in the world that does not pay artists and record labels for 
uh, radio airplay on AM, FM radio, um, and they recommended that that be changed. Um, revising the consent decrees for BMI and ASCAP. BMI and ASCAP are the two writer performing rights organizations in the US, and they're operating under judicial orders that constrain, to some degree, what they're able to do. And the Copyright Office felt like those should be revised. Uh, allowing for musical rights organizations within the US, so much like you guys have in Australia or um, they have in the UK or other countries, allowing that sound, sound recording performance right uh, to be governed or um, licensed by the same group that's um, handling a musical composition performance right, or at least somehow interconnected, um, or allowing the mechanical licenses to be licensed by the same group that's licensing the public performance. Uh, could allow for more ease and fluidity in the payment cycle process. Um, changing the mechanical licensing system in the US, so allowing um, rights owners to opt out of new media uses. Um, considering sound recording rates when setting the rates for musical compositions. So again, going back to this idea of paying fairly between the musical composition and the sound recording. Um, and then they recommended two things that we were really looking at within this report. One was the comprehensive rights database. So right now, generally, in the, around the world, under the Berne Convention, you are not, no country can require um, copyright registration for international protection. So in general, folks are not required to register a copyright, and that means, while that's great, it means that there's no impetus on an artist or writer to have to register in order to have their copyright. What it means is that, again, there's no um, trail of ownership, or there's no ability to find the people that actually own the works. So they recommended that that be created, but by the private, um, private world, not by, not by public government. And then also that the private sector should, adapt, uh, should adopt best practices for transparency and payment distributions or disbursements to writers and artists. Uh, so as a result of this, we made some recommendations. So our goal really was to try to effectuate, like I said, a positive musical ecosystem and better rights for uh, artists and songwriters. One was the Creator's Bill of Rights. So it sounds fairly simple, but um, basically the idea that artists and writers should be treated ethically. Uh, one was a fair music transparency certification. One was a decentralized rights ownership database, uh, exploration of blockchain technology, and then education for creators. And I'll talk a little bit about each of those. Um, so some basic ideas for a creator's bill of rights. Every creator deserves to be fairly compensated for the, right, for the use of his or her works. Every creator deserves to know exactly where those works are being uh, consumed or streamed. Every creator deserves up-to-date reporting on where those works are being used or streamed. Every creator deserves to be recognized for the creation of his or her works. Every creator deserves to know the um, entire payment stream, so who's taking a cut and how much. And every creator deserves the right to set the price for his or her works. Uh, we also recommended a fair music transparency certification. So as you guys know, or as you likely know, there's a number of other fair trade organizations that um, certify that, that something is being operated within an ethical standard. Um, it began with the fair trade coffee movement. Um, but in this particular case, there would be a nonprofit organization that is certifying that these uh, digital services are operating with some specified level of transparency. Um, there would also be a unique um, identifier that links the ISRC and ISWC codes. And then there would be a minimum level of, of outputs required from each streaming service and some standardization of formats in which they report. Okay. <laughs> Decentralized rights database. So we talked a little bit about the black box and the fact that um, licensing music and paying for music can be difficult or complicated because of the lack of a rights registry database. And the EU has actually tried to adopt this. They tried to create a centralized registry system uh, beginning in 2008. They worked on it for about four years. They spent, I believe, between 15 and 20 million euros with 
Deloitte. Um, and there was never any output from that. They, they had a lot of meetings, they had a lot of discussions about how particularly the PROs within Europe could put their rights ownership information into a database. And the project broke down in 2012 because there was a lot of um, dispute among the different organizations as to how it could work. Um, so instead, we recommend something that's decentralized, so providing a decentralized registry that operates similar to the domain name registry system. So at the heart is a nonprofit, much like the ICANN system for domain names, and then surrounding that is a commercial um, registration system, uh, again, like you see with domain names where uh, you have Bluehost or GoDaddy or other um, registers surrounding that central nonprofit. <coughs> Anyone could register a work, so if you're a, a writer or a creator, you could go onto the service and register your work, and then there would be an alternative dispute resolution process. So. Uh, if two people claim the same work, there would be the ability to go in and dispute, um, and it would work through some type of arbitration as to who actually owns the work. Um, right now, the, the expectation is that there will be 100 million songs available for streaming on digital services within 10 years, so that's a growth from about 25 to 30 million today. And if you look at perhaps registering just going forward and thinking about backfilling the, the back information at a later date, at least we can get started. So the problem to date has been trying to get everyone on the same page and everyone in the same room to agree exactly on how to move forward. And uh, we're just advocating that we start something that's decentralized, has a little bit less room for dispute at the outset, and start to build it um, as we move forward. Uh, exploration of blockchain technology. So blockchain is the um, technology that powers cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and it allows for tremendous transparency, and it also allows for payment at source. So blockchain actually allows you to, to enter the contractual information as music is uploaded, and the streaming service or the streaming service through blockchain can distribute payments immediately. So if you are a record label, this could save you on royalty administration because blockchain is handling it for you. Essentially, the contract information gets uploaded onto the blockchain system, which is, again is a decentralized computer network. And at the moment at which um, an artist or writer's so uh, song is streamed, the payment actually goes directly into their account based on the contractual terms. The amount that's due to the publisher goes into their account. The amount that's due to the record label goes into their account. Um, it has a track log which essentially offers complete transparency and also his, um, historical, a historical look at payments. Um, it's all paid, as I said, instantaneously and at source. Uh, particularly, this can be interesting for user-generated content. So if you are a, a writer um, and you record your song that you've written or you're an artist and you record a cover song and you upload it to a user-generated content site, you could assign the rights ownership information when you upload it and then have it paid out based on the rights information that you put into that upload. Um, Imogene Heap, if you're um, familiar with Imogene, she's a, a British artist. She's working on a project called Mycelia uh, that I think she's launching in October that's based on blockchain. So she will uh, record a song and release it online um, and then using blockchain technology allow other people to cover it and be paid using uh, that technology. And then finally, we recommended just some level of education for creators. So um, just making sure that all creators understand or have a basic knowledge of how their rights work. Uh, obviously, in international, across borders, um, rights work a little bit differently they, in Australia than they do in the EU, than they do in the US. Uh, but making sure that creators have some level of understanding about how uh, the money is being paid so that they can do a better job of watching out for themselves. So the, the clock says that I'm over time, so I think I need to wrap up. Uh, but if you would like to learn more, you can check out the report at rethink-music.com. We also have an event in Boston on October the 2nd where we're gonna launch phase two. Phase two of our project is building in conjunction with MIT and UCLA in the US uh, technology architecture for a copyrights registry database, as well as integrating blockchain technology into that architecture. So, thanks very much.